Uh, yes, we'll be recording. Um, and good morning to the to those of you on Zoom. And the camera's right over there. Yep. I can see that. And to our uh, our people here in person, we're in the Acorn Room today, folks. Um, a little smaller room, but in a way, um, I think a little nicer because it feels like we're both through together. Uh, <laughs> our program this morning is on a subject that is in the news every day, Ukraine. Um, our, our speaker has a good deal of personal experience in addition to his academic work um, with the region. He's worked with NATO, uh, with national security here in the U.S. Um, so he, he's been kind of around the block a few times in terms of, of um, how you might develop different perspectives on this uh, on, on the Ukraine situation. I'm going to turn it over now to Carla Ruffer, who is our coordinator for this program. She brings it all together, brings the speakers to us from uh, uh, Center for European Studies, and she'll formally introduce our speaker today, who, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, his parents were here at Oak Hammock for quite a number of years, so that is very familiar, uh, and probably see some familiar faces there as well. Uh, Carla? Thank you so much. It's nice to see everyone again. Sorry, it was last week. Um, so just uh, a few formal lines, although I think Ron made an introduction there. Um, so Zachary Selman is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science. Um, he focuses on U.S. national security and alliances with an emphasis on the transatlantic relationship. And his first book, Economic Sanctions as Instruments of American Foreign Policy, examines the use of sanctions and provides a framework for understanding when and why they succeed or fail in further American national interests. So I'm going to do that All right. Well, I hope some of my thoughts. So it's always a pleasure to come out here and, and, and talk to you people because I spend my life dealing with, you know, people who are the average age of about 20 or 21. And they're great, but I mean, honestly, I've got, I mean, I think the shirt's older than most of them. And so they, they don't have a lot of perspective, right? And so if I talk about stuff like I will today, you know, about the end of the Cold War and the early 1990s and all the tumult then, which I mean, Jerry knows intimately, um, you know, that's just right over their head. I mean, I'm going to be talking about the Roman Empire. So if you guys understand it, you have a distinct understanding. So uh, what are we going to first? The PowerPoint, yeah. not the map. Yeah, that's true. So <clears throat> I really want to sort of focus on a couple of big questions. I mean, the first one is how did we get here? How do we find ourselves again in this absurd and tragic situation of a war in Europe? We shouldn't be here, but we are. So how did this happen? And I'll give you my perspective. It's one of you know many possible ones, and you may disagree or have points of view about that that are different, and that's great. Let's talk about it. Um, I'm giving you my perspective, not as a expert on Ukraine, but as someone who worked at NATO or NATO Parliamentary Assembly uh, when I was Deputy Secretary General for Policy there. Part of my portfolio with outreach to partner countries. Ukraine was one of the big partner countries we worked with. So I went there quite a lot over the span of about a decade, 2003 to 2013. Um, met with them, talked to a lot of government officials, a lot of members of parliament. Um, I was there as an election monitor for two elections as well. So I, I have some feel for the country and what goes on there, um, but more about, I think, the NATO, US, EU, Ukraine relationship and how this fits with Russia and Russia's strategic perspective. So we'll do that. Um, and then I want to sort of talk a little bit about you know what has been the US role and in the region, and not just the United States, right? That's that's important, but also the European Union, which is a huge factor in this as well, right? And NATO as an organization to which the United States belongs, but has its own independent character as well. So how do we sort of square the circle between these big interested parties, Russia, Ukraine, EU, NATO, the United States, um, how does this all work out? And then really sort of getting into the back end, what, what are some potential outcomes? 
questions. I mean, where does this end up? Um, you know, and I've got a couple of potential outcomes I can throw at you. You may have others, and we'll have an open discussion, as well as what are some options? Where do we go from here? And I think, you know, at this point, anything you can come up with can't be any worse than what's already been tried, probably, right? So, I mean, that's the thing about, you know, about policy, right? You, you, you're stuck in awful situations and you have to make the best of it, right? And it's not a matter of choosing what's the good policy versus what's the bad policy, but more often than not, trying to figure out what's the least bad thing I can do with imperfect information and not really being in control of what the other side is going to do. Right? So whenever people complain about you know, policy failures, and why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? It's much more complex right, when you're in that situation than it looks like from the outside. Um, all right, so I want to go to the next slide. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. That's right. That's the role of the calendar. It's uh, this one. There we go. Um, Let's start off with this first big question. How do we get to the situation? And as I said, absurd and tragic from any perspective. I mean, the, the, the damage to infrastructure in Ukraine is going to take years to re, recoup from. There are millions of refugees around Europe. Politics. There are, we don't know how many military casualties. I mean, the most reasonable estimates that I've seen just on the Russian side were 20,000. Uh, who knows on the Ukrainian side? So this is really just a defining and tragic event going on right in front of us. And I, I think you have to sort of dig back into the past and understand that Ukraine occupies a very particular situation, ge geopolitical in the region, that has kind of put it between, you know, the West and Russia in some very difficult ways. Um, and that Ukraine has a very complicated history with both Russia and the West. We can't ignore the geopolitics of history. Now, Ukraine's on the western border of Russia, um, and that's, let me just forward to this map to give you a better picture. Um, you have a pointer too, which Yeah, so a broader. The top one? Aha, uh -huh, yeah. So a broader map of. Um, of Ukraine, you sort of see where, where it kind of broadly fits into Europe, smack there between Russia and you know Western Europe, or Eastern Europe, that one. Um, and, and this is an area, you know, if you're familiar with the history of World War II, that became essentially the superhighway of the Nazi invasion into the Soviet Union. Right? This was you know a brutal path that the Nazis cut through here. And some of the biggest battles on the Eastern Front were fought, if not in Ukraine, then immediately outside of it. Um, you know, if you're a military historian, you know that Kursk is kind of a name that comes up as the, uh, not the largest tank battle in World War II. I think it was, you know, one of the largest tank battles ever in history. Um, and of course, Stalingrad is just a little bit to the, to the east of the Ukrainian border. And of course, during World War II, and when Putin speaks of, you know, Nazis taking over Ukraine, what he's referring to is that during this period of time, there were some members of sort of Ukrainian nationalist movements who did fight with the Nazi um, German forces against the Soviet Union. Right? There were some. It's absolutely true. But there was a reason, right? And the reason has to go back to this very sort of complex history. So Ukraine was an integral part of the Soviet Union. Right? It had not been an independent country prior to the Soviet Union existing. It had either been under Russian control or whatever, but it was never independent. During the 1930s, under Stalin, a distinct political decision was taken, which was to take Ukraine as the breadbasket of Ukraine and take all of its product export it for hard currency and use that to industrialize the country. But in doing so, it was a deliberate policy to starve to death millions of Ukrainian peasants. I mean, also as a political thing to break the back of independent peasants in Ukraine. Ukrainians still remember this. They call it the Holy War, right? And this is seared into the Ukrainian national consciousness. So 
Yes, Ukraine was an integral part of the Soviet Union. Um, you have tremendous ties on history and language, you know, the, the original sort of um, Russian dynasties. It's, uh, well, actually, sort of were based in Kiev, right? The, the Kievan Rus kings are sort of a big factor in sort of Russian history. Languages are very closely associated. They are distinct, but they are very similar in a lot of ways. Um, but there's also this strong resentment based in, in historical realities that you can't just sort of wave away. They're there. Um, and this one down here at the bottom, this is sort of a picture taken from what was known as the Orange Revolution in 2004, when Ukrainian citizens rose up and pushed out a very corrupt and um, Russian-oriented government and brought, bring, brought in really the first sort of Western-oriented um, government under yeah, uh, sorry, Yushchenko. Uh, um, so this was kind of a, a critical event that shifted Ukraine in an orientation at that point in time much more towards the West and integration into the West rather than the East. And you know, it's a country that's very much on the border of the United States. So where are we now? Well, Ukraine's been an independent country since 1991. And there's been a lot of back and forth in terms of its foreign policy orientation. I mean, just in the times that I was working there, you know, on these issues, there were times when we had Ukrainian governments that were, we want to integrate into the European Union, we want to integrate into NATO. And other times they're like, well, you know, we don't really want to be part of anything. We want to be neutral. We want to fit into any block. We want to try to sort of be friends with everybody. And that's fine. We were always able to work with that. We never had bad relations. But it did go back and forth depending on the political administration in the country, as one might expect. Um, and this, I think, has a lot to do with this next map. Bring it up. Oops. Uh, skip ahead here. This is. You know, as it says, an ethno-linguistic map of Ukraine. Um, so the red parts here are uh, are mostly Ukrainian-speaking peoples, or are primarily Ukrainian-speaking. If you go out here, you know the yellow browns down here. This is mostly Russian, ethnically Russian, Russian speaking as a main language. So you think about where the fighting is, right? You think about where the battles are it's out here down here. So that starts to make some sense. You have a country which has been divided along these lines. Right? There are people who linguistically, culturally, economically, because they're close to the Russian border, are more attuned towards Russia. And there's you know, a large chunk of the country, which is Ukrainian um, and has a Ukrainian national identity that is increasingly more oriented towards the West or being part of the European Union, or it's being part of all those structures. That's a hard sort of thing to just resolve. You can't just wave your hands and make that distinction go away. So that's the um, basic reality that we're dealing with here. Um, let me just skip down to here. So still getting into this question, has it come to war? Because yes, the country can go back and forth in its orientations, whether it's more friendly towards Russia or more friendly towards the West, not necessarily leading us to a position where we're involved in a massive and destructive war. So if you go back into the early 2000s, after that sort of first revolution, um, 2004, 5, 6 period, Ukraine expressed a lot of interest. And I remember we were getting a lot of pressure from Ukrainian diplomats about Ukraine being able to join, and they always phrased it as Euro-Atlantic institutions, meaning they wanted to join the European Union and NATO. They were kind of trying to do sort of a push on both those things at the same time. Um, the reality was they were nowhere near ready to do that on any of the criteria that either organization had. And so there was a question around 2008 about whether NATO should offer what we call a membership action plan to Ukraine, which is not a guarantee of membership, but it kind of puts you in that track, right? It's a formalized track that says, okay, now we're gonna work with you, but we're gonna start creating a kind of a checklist of things you need to do. And as you check them off, if you do it all, then we can actually talk about membership. 
So it doesn't set a date certain, but it does kind of put you in, you know, like a, kind of like that Star Trek analogy. It's, it's got you in the track loop, right? It's gonna, it's gonna pull you in eventually. Nobody could really agree on whether or not that was a good idea. There were some states, the United States pushing for that, others saying, yeah, we don't think so. And the real issue was nobody really wanted to annoy Russia that much. And they thought that would be a real red flag wave in front of Russia. And Ukraine wasn't anywhere near ready either. So let's just kind of put it to one side. But at the same time, nobody wanted to offend the Ukrainians who were very eager and really were doing an awful lot to try to improve themselves. And so <clears throat> the actual declaration of the summit, and I'm quoting here, says Ukraine will be a member, right? We're not giving you a, an actual plan for joining, but you will be a member, but there's no date specified. It's just this kind of aspirational goal. And that was kind of the diplomatic hand wave that kind of pasted over all this. Um, so that lasted for a while. And like I said, Ukraine went back and forth. Sometimes they were much more interested in pursuing this. Other times, I remember about 2010, they said, you know what, we don't want to do that. Anymore. We just want to sort of leave, let things stay the way they are. And we're going to try and maintain this kind of no block status. Okay. Um, in 2014, though, you have a big shift. In 2014, Ukraine at that point is under a very pro Russian government. Uh, the Yanukovych government, and it was about to sign an agreement with Russia that would really orient Ukraine politically and, and in terms of trade much more with Russia. And this is not popular with large portions of the Ukrainian population. There are protests, and there are riots, and they get violent. And the government is Quite violent and putting them down. People are killed in the street. This brews up more and more, and it turns into a full fledged revolution. The president Yanukovych is forced to flee. Uh, he flees to Russia. A new government comes in, and that government uh, is, has a much more sort of Western orientation. And it immediately turns around and says, No, what we're going to do is we're going to sign an association agreement with the European Union. That's the point of our trade and sort of put us more in a, a pattern towards being able to eventually join the European Union and be part of that family of nations. That was a real problem for Russia, right? Because Russia did not see that as something that was an organic event in Ukraine by Ukrainian citizens. The Russian government perceived that as Western powers meddling in our region, you know, creating through covert measures this revolution, driving out an elected president, installing this other regime that's now taking the country in a different direction that is a threat to our direct interests. And a big part of Russian foreign policy across that region has been, for, for a very, very long time, to maintain control over the states that are on its immediate borders, right? to have that kind of buffer zone, that kind of control that doesn't allow other major powers to have influence immediately in their area. Right? So it's an important consideration for Russia, and they viewed it once again as not a product of Ukrainian politics, but rather outside players, particularly the United States, and sort of moving a piece on the geopolitical chessboard as a way to try to checkmate that. That's very much how they saw it. And so that leads to the next set of things that happens that puts us down this road. Which is not long after this, and also in 2014, you have these Russian militias in this eastern part of the country. Um, once again, I'll just go back to this map. Back here, this is the Luhansk and Donetsk, so right out here, it's militias that ostensibly are, you know, independent organic entities operating there, the people who just sort of rose up, but they are very closely tied to Russian government uh, entities, which are supplying them obviously with weapons and whatever else. 
uh, they rise up, they see certain areas, and then they're joined. These are some of the militia folks down here. You can't see them, they're sort of ragtag uniforms. But very quickly, they're joined by people who look like this, that the Ukrainians start to refer to as little green men. Um, why? Well, you know, from what we know, they're usually Russian special forces, uh, Spetsnaz, but you know, they keep their faces covered so they can't be identified through facial recognition software that they know our intelligence services use. Um, they're wearing uniforms, but the uniforms have no insignias. So they're just you know, sort of these blank green figures, right, that, that turn up. And they're always listed as volunteers, right? Of course, you know, Russians see their ethnic brethren on the other side of the border rising up to seize their rights against the illegitimate government. And of course, people are going to come across to volunteer to help them. Why wouldn't they? How can we stop them? So there was always this level of plausible deniability, right? I mean, it was fairly obvious as to what was going on, but you always had this, this sort of plausible deniability that this, this was not a directed Russian government operation. Um, well, that happens in Donbass um, and Luhansk, but it also happens down in, in Crimea. Um, let me just go back to that map real fast. That's this brown area down here, which is predominantly ethnically Russian um, and a home to a very large set of Russian military facilities. Uh, it's also the only region that when in 1991, they actually had a vote to see, you know, do we want to be independent or state part of the Soviet Union? Every oblast, every province up here voted to be independent, except for Crimea. Right? And I think that reflects its strong Russian character. So with that, these regions essentially break away. They're not recognized by any other countries. Well, maybe Venezuela or something like that, but they're not recognized as being separate entities now been kind of absorbed into Russia technically, but once again, no one internationally recognizes that. Um, so that's where things are in 2014. You have this fighting along these lines here. Um, you know, you have Crimea pulled away uh, from Ukraine, but, you know, it can't quite scatter. It's, it's not, it's a, it's a frozen conflict in the terminology of the region. There's, their lines are drawn, but nothing's really moving very much. Um, so that's where we are in 2014. Now, um, why is that important? Well, obviously, Ukraine is not thrilled with this situation, and they come to NATO and in particular major NATO allies like the United States and say, look, we want more military assistance and help and aid. And we want to be really serious about developing a solid military. Because the Ukrainian military had a lot of problems in my opinion. And so a lot of work was done with them. Right? Um, the United States was very heavily active in training them. Uh, in fact, the Florida National Guard was with them quite a lot for a while. Um, but other countries as well. And on lots of things, on you know, better communications, and logistics, and transport, and all sorts of things. NATO was being extremely careful here not to really push the envelope too much and do anything that would be seen as too provocative towards Russia. There's always that sensitivity that, yeah, we're going to need to help Ukraine, but you don't want to turn this into a big dust out with Russia. So let's just try and sort of, you know, drive a line down the middle there. Um, and they stay in this position for, you know, six, seven years. Now, why is this important? Well, Russia had achieved a very important political role for it. Russia really doesn't want states on its borders becoming more closely associated with the European Union or with NATO. It wants to be able to maintain control over them, if not, you know, through actual territorial domination than through political and economic influence. Well, by doing this, right, by creating this sort of frozen territorial conflict in Ukraine, 
Russia had achieved the major goal because neither the European Union nor NATO is ever going to bring in a new member that has a territorial conflict with Russia. You are not going to import that problem into your organization. So until this issue is settled, and of course Russia controls it, Ukraine is not going anywhere in terms of membership with either the European Union or NATO. So that's a good situation for Russia. Right? You achieve a major foreign policy goal, frankly, at a pretty limited cost. I mean, there were some sanctions imposed and et cetera, nasty letters written, but at the end of the day, much really happened to Russia. So from my perspective, um, at that point in time, I thought, you know, that's pretty much how things are going to stay because it's a good situation, good outcome for Russia. Um, and so how do you end up with war in 2022? Why doesn't it just sort of stay in this frozen position? So let me make a confession. Um, and, and based on this, you can then question everything else I have to say. Uh, so the war begins in uh, what, February 24th, um, this past year, of this year, 2022. So I remember on Valentine's Day, I was having, so 10 days before this, I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues who asked me, he said, you think Russia's actually going to war in Ukraine? I said, no, absolutely not. And the reason why is because they don't, as I just explained, they already achieved their major political goals, strategic goals. Why risk an armed conflict and all that that bring when, you, when you've already got 10% of what you want? Right? That doesn't make any sense. That's not logical to me. Um, and so I was wrong, very wrong. And so part of what I want to try and walk through today is trying to understand why I was wrong and what that might mean. Um, all right, so given that, right, why would you go to war in 2022? Um, you know, I think one possible explanation is that the Russian government was convinced this was going to be a cakewalk. This was going to be easy, right? That the Ukrainian military, which they had encountered in 2014, was poorly trained, uh, poorly equipped, had let, yeah, pretty poor logistical and communication systems, not very well motivated in a lot of ways, and that this would be an easy thing to walk through. And, you know, if you look back at their, what they were doing, let me find a map here that we have. This one. So <clears throat> if you think about what actually happened in February 2022, Right. The Russian military is all like already heavily ensconced out here, right? The sort of Donetsk Luhansk region. Um, they had a large military presence down here in the south, and they had put a very large military presence in Belarus, ostensibly under training exercises. And Belarus, being essentially a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Russia, right, will we'll sort of do what and allow whatever Russia wants to do. And if you notice the capital city here, you know is very close to the Belarusian border. So if you think about it, you know, I've got three prongs that I can launch in here. I've got one coming down from the north that's almost certain to seize the capital city in a very short period of time, depose the existing government, put in my own while my forces push up from this direction and this direction. And in a few days, it's a fait accompli, right? Capital's fallen, the government's fled. I put in a new one, and my troops control half the country, and the Ukrainian military is on the run to the West. That may have seemed like a good plan. Right? Um, what it failed to account for is that over the intervening six or seven years, the Ukrainian military was a lot improved or greatly improved from what it had been. Um, and it was highly motivated to stop this sort of thing from occurring. So that's one possibility, but I think there's some other broader discussions that I think I need to uh, bring up here that really deal with more about ideas and, and Russia's sense or the Russian government's sense of what the Russian nation is and what its purpose is and what the ideology that motivates it is. Things that I perhaps did not take fully into account in my 
bold predictions of uh, Valentine's Day. Um, and I, you can kind of run them all together at some level, sort of demonstration of Russian power and the will to use it to create or cement Russia's position as a great power. This is an obsession with Russian leadership. And it really goes back to something that Vladimir Putin has emphasized numerous times. Right? Whenever he talks about the collapse of the Soviet Union, he, he speaks of it as the great geopolitical trash, right? um, sometimes in physical terms, as a heart attack for Russia. Uh, the greatly diminished it. Right? And it's not that he's, you know, angling for the recreation of the Soviet Union, but rather something deeper and, and more meaningful in a way, which is trying to establish and reestablish control and power over the regions that Russia had controlled through its imperialist policy going back to the Tsarist period, Central Asia, right? Ukraine, the Caucasus region, you know, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, the Baltic regions, all these places which have broken away and sort of fallen out of the Russian orbit. And if you can't pull those back in, right, Russia isn't a great power in the way it once was. It needs to establish that kind of control and influence to get its standing in the world to be, once again, the great power that it should be. Um, so it's not so much a matter of reconstituting the Soviet Union, but rather, I think, digging back into something older um, about Russian national interests that go really predate um, ideas of the Soviet Union. So there's that. Um, I also think there's something of an ideological component to this that I frankly discounted at the time, but I think is actually quite important. Um, when you listen to Putin, and in particular, when you listen to some of his advisors, his intellectuals, Alexander Dugan and people like that who have been advising him, um, there is often a discussion that Russia represents a different model of global affairs. And they often phrase it as, and I'm going to use their words because I think they're very telling, a, in opposition to direct opposition to the Anglo Saxon model, not necessarily just American, but sort of Anglo Saxon vision, and sort of harking back to the, from their perspective, was a corruption that comes from models of governance that focus in on individualism, and individual rights. Um, that are lacking in spirituality, and that this Russian model, right, that fits for Russia, is one rooted in these, you know, sort of mystical ideas of, of Russian national identity and Russian spiritual identity. It is fundamentally, you know, oriented towards the community rather than the individual. It is oriented towards the, um, the traditional and the spiritual rather than the material and the material gratification. And so there is this sort of ideological struggle going on between these two very different visions. And that from their perspective, the West is sort of launching this kind of wholehearted tax toxic attack on Russian identity and Russian civilization. And that has to be resisted and pushed back against. And then from that perspective, right, Putin may actually believe that his own rhetoric about Ukraine not being a real country. Okay? So from his perspective in this, Ukraine is a Slavic country, was clearly part of the Russian heartland, had been for centuries, right? Why is it now an independent country? It's an independent country because Western powers have meddled in their corrupted things, you know, bribed politicians, tried to turn them away from what their civilizational place in the world should be. They belong as part of the greater Russian spiritual, cultural community. And that's what they want, right? It's just that their government leaders pull them in a different direction. So as we go in with this, large portions of the Ukrainian population will rally to us. Right, understanding that 
this is this is really a fight for that. Now that obviously didn't happen, right? But one does get the sense from the discussion that goes on in the Kremlin, you know, how they talk to each other, how these sort of intellectual leaders, Dugan and others, talk about this, that, that these ideas are real and that you can animate them. And honestly, before February 24th, I put all that stuff aside. I said, yeah, yeah, sure. People talk about a lot of things, but at the end of the day, it's about geopolitical power and interests and you know, playing the game of international relations to get what you want at the lowest cost possible. I, I think my sort of you know economic rational actor model that I have of things didn't quite work. I, I think I've been forced to sort of reassess and look at some of these much more what you might call squishier factors in international relations. So that's my mea culpa. Um, and I put that out there. Um, all right, so that's how we get to war, right? Um, what's happened so far? Where are we? Um, remember you know, that map that we had? Um, uh, you pull that up on that's great. Um, let's back to this version. So, you know, as you're all aware from reading the newspaper, the initial invasion. Always not work, right? Um, you know, at first it seems like Russia is just going to be able to roll right across Ukraine. Nothing happened. Right? They're, they're stopped. They're stopped well short of Kiev. Uh, they were pushed back uh, rather rapidly. And now we're seeing quite a significant uh, counteroffensive. Go ahead, do it. Um, And this is a map from um, the Institute for the Study of War. It's in Washington, D.C. It's run by uh, uh, Frederick and Kimberly Kagan, um, who are both sort of military historians. Uh, and they've actually got a, a very interesting project where they take all the available open source in, um, intelligence and information. And they're updating this map, this interactive map on Ukraine on a daily basis that really shows you where things are changing and, and where they're not. Um, and so what you can see, and you can zoom in on this and, and do whatever you want with it. It's kind of fun uh, if you like this sort of stuff and you see where the lines are and what's changing. But as you can see, you know, the blue is uh, areas that Ukraine has taken in this counteroffensive. Uh, they started up there in the north around Kharkiv. They have pushed the Russian forces back considerably um, in that area. Um, at the same time, there's a second and, and probably far more important offensive down here in this region around uh, <clears throat> Kherson. Kherson's a big city, uh, and it is one that is uh, been controlled by Russia since the beginning of this war. If that falls apart, right, uh, it's going to be a very big blow to Russia, and it's going to open up it's going to open up possibly a road coming back down here towards uh, Crimea. So, if nothing else, it may be entirely possible to split, um, you know, the Russian occupation area. Uh, so, this is what's where we are now, right? It's not what people projected or expected back in February and March, um, but it's looking to be, you know, the momentum is definitely on the Ukrainian side at this point in time. Uh, here, let me go back to my slides. Okay. Uh, so yeah, if you want to look at this sort of stuff, the Institute for the Study of War updates that on a daily basis. You know, you know, like the war. Let me get it back inside your mother. Okay. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> one of the things, like I said, we discovered is that all that training, all that effort uh, paid off. Right? You know, the, the old joke in, in military circles is that amateurs talk about strategy and professionals talk about logistics. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of truth to that, right? You know, logistics is how you get the stuff you need to the people at the right time. <coughs> Russia has been awful about this, just awful. One of the things we've seen is just all the weaknesses in the Russian military structure. Uh, their communication systems were awful and easily penetrated. And you know, so it was very difficult for them to have secure communications. Their navigation abilities, even in a country 
that you think they would know very well, that's right on their border, they were getting lost, right? Um, they were running out their logistical supplies for chains were awful. You had units out there that weren't getting food and weren't getting ammunition, or therefore just useless. And that's when you saw, you know, Russian soldiers going out looting supermarkets to try and feed themselves. Um, you know, none of this speaks to a military that's really prepared for a serious fight. And that may just be revealing that they thought it would be quick and easy, but it seems to reveal some much deeper structural flaws in the Russian military. Uh, you know, on the other hand, all this training with Ukraine has made them a much more effective force. Right? They were able to outmaneuver um, and, and hit Russia in ways that you know, frankly, the Russian military did not expect. So Russia has been forced to retreat, uh, gave up its plans to capture the capital, pulled completely back from that, to try to focus on essentially holding the territory it had in eastern and southern Ukraine. But even that started to look uh, dicey from the Ukrainian side. But the end result is we have had absolutely brutal warfare over the course of these months, which has left cities in rubble, uh, huge numbers of refugees flowing around, uh, tremendous infrastructural damage. This is going to take years and trillions of dollars to recover from, right? And for what, right? Because nothing is gonna come of this for Russia if it's like that. Um, all right, with that, let me sort of say where we are now and start to wrap this up. So, as I said, Ukraine has made major advances in pushing Russian forces back. A lot of that has to do, frankly, with American assistance. Right? It's not just the equipment, it's been the training over these many years. Um, but it helps. It's also the intelligence. Right? We've been sharing a lot of very accurate real-time intelligence that enables them to hit very accurately the things that, that need to be hit to slow down any kind of Russian advance. Uh, <clears throat> we've also given them, uh, that middle picture is the, the HIMARS rocket system you may have read about. It's a very mobile, relatively light um, rocket system with a pretty significant range. We haven't given the Ukrainians the really long range versions, but we've given them missiles that will hit about 50, 60 miles out which is forcing and, and very accurate, uh, which when combined with that intelligence is making it very difficult for Russia to keep supply lines going anywhere in that sort of 50, 60 mile radius. So, um, you know, the end result is an enormous amount of Russian equipment destroyed. Um, a lot of trained personnel have either been wounded or, or killed and Russia is calling up reserves and frankly, and this is you know yet another element of this They are pulling in people who have no business being in a combat situation and giving them virtually no training and throwing them out there to die. Um, you know, this to me is um, you know yet another cool byproduct of this this insane situation. Um, there was just a piece I think at the New York Times, the Washington Post yesterday about literally press gangs running around in St. Petersburg and, you know, grabbing you know, fight careers. And saying, yeah, now you're in the military, you're gonna go. Um, and they're getting virtually no training. I mean, literally days of training before they're sent out. I mean, even in, you know, the depths of World War II when the United States was trying to rapidly pull together a force to, to be able to send overseas, even the, you know, the, the, the greenest recruits, I think, had a eight or nine weeks of basic training. I mean, it, it wasn't much, but it was something, right? I mean, this is being compressed down to a matter of days. It's hard to imagine those people are ever going to be an effective fighting force. Most likely, they're just going to get killed. And so this, to me, is just more of the, the cruelty of them thinking of all of what's happening. Um, I put a picture of Elon Musk up here. Uh, the reason I did is because he proposed a, you know, said openly to Ukraine, you know what, guys, maybe this is a time to have negotiated settlement. You're making progress. 
maybe now we should try to settle this. Um, you know, we'll come up with some parameters of negotiation. You, know, you stay out of NATO when Russia pulls out of most of the territory and we'll keep some of it. Let's just call this thing over. That was soundly rejected by the Ukrainian authorities. And while you know it may seem like a good idea and a way to put an end to this conflict, it's not politically viable. And the reason it's not politically viable is that if you think back to the early part of this conflict, when Ukraine blunted the Russian advance, there was a negotiation, right? The Ukrainian side and the Russian side sat down and started to talk. Now, I don't think that's possible. I don't think it's possible because there has been so much bloodshed and so much brutality. So, when Russian forces retreated from the areas around you and pushed back north, the images started coming out of mass graves, of torture, of abuse and rape of civilians. It is very difficult, if not impossible, for any political leadership in Ukraine now to sit down and say, okay, we're going to negotiate something that's going to give up bits of our territory to Russia after that happened. Okay? It would be very difficult for a political leader to survive that kind of compromise, given the images that are now seared in Ukrainian political consciousness. I just don't see that happening. Even if, you know, at the end of the day, maybe it will be the best deal you can get. I don't see it being politically possible. But once again, I've been wrong about everything else so far. So <laughs> um, and then finally, another point to, to discuss uh, <clears throat> Russia's less than subtle threats to escalate to use attack for nuclear weapons. At one point, you can just sort of say, well, that's all, right? I mean, who the hell is going to use a nuclear weapon? on this or why what that wouldn't that just be crazy well i personally take it pretty seriously um and let me offer my logic here um if you view this as i suggested earlier that the russian government sees this as not just a, a geopolitical struggle or you know control of a piece of territory but rather something fundamental to the survival of Russian culture and the nation, broadly speaking, and its history and its place as a great power. And that if it is pushed back from this, all of that is at stake. That puts you in a much more desperate position. Right? The issue becomes much more existential and you may be willing to, you know, and as the Russians like to say, escalate to de-escalate escalate to the use of nuclear weapons, which would then shock everyone so much that they would be forced to try to find ways to accommodate you and bring things down. It could go horribly the opposite direction too. Um, all I can say is that, you know, as we get to this position where Russia loses more and more ground and the whole thing starts to collapse, these desperate options may start to be more realistic. And we need to be very, very careful about how things go to ensure that that does not become uh, what they see as their only way out. And that, I think, is a, a real issue we need to think about. Um, all right, I'm going to try and wrap up here. We've been talking for a while. Um, so, last thing to talk about, um, you know, I'm always reluctant to make predictions. Um, so, I'm going to just sort of phrase things as probabilities. Right? What do I think is the most likely thing to happen? Well, you know, if you're kind of a intellectually conservative, you know, from an analytic perspective, um, things more or less trundle along kind of the way they are, which is probably the most likely thing. Uh, you have a protracted stalemate, right? You know, Ukraine's not really able to break through, especially as the weather gets worse. Uh, Russia hangs on to a lot of the territory it currently has, and we're looking at pretty much the same situation into next spring sometime. You know, that's probably where we are. Less likely, but still a real possibility, and it's something we haven't mentioned at all yet, but, but we probably want to get to, is that Russia's pressure on European energy supplies starts to produce some cracks in the European Union and in NATO. I think that is a real possibility, um, you know, and that that would eventually 
force some governments to cut assistance to Ukraine uh, in order to reestablish trade links, gas links with Russia mm. to supply them, um, and that this might be a real issue in Europe as we go into the winter, especially if it's a cold, bitter winter and not a lot of wind to drive windmills. So I, I don't think it's the most likely thing, but it's a distinct possibility. Um, unlikely, but also still possible. You know, it's kind of a wild card event. Have a coup in Russia. Um, why don't I think it's relatively unlikely? Well, Vladimir Putin has been in power since what, 2000, 2001, right about that. Um, so more than 20 years, right? You don't stay in power as an authoritarian dictator without having a really good sense of who might pose a threat to you within the system. So I'm sure he understands and is very, very good about preventing anything like this from happening. But if you have enough dissatisfaction at the higher echelons, you see that this is going horribly awry and something has to change, particularly if you see that you know, in the intelligence sector in Russia, it's possible. And a new regime could possibly try to cut a deal that would end this as soon as possible. So that's a possibility, but it's a wild card. And I think well as well. So that's where I'm going to stop. Um, and I'm happy to talk with you about any of what I've talked about or anything you want to bring up on. Um, so I will, I don't know people's names, so um, I'll just, uh, I'm going to. Oh, I'm going to call you now. I'm sorry. I have a very wild idea. Okay. But since we're talking about everything, right? Yes. How about opening a second front? And the second front would be uh, Korea Islands and Sakhalin, because Japanese would love to have that. <laughs> and they would do well if you put the name on it. And circle it around in that area towards the sea and so on. He said, Well, there is a lot of oil. So Russia probably has some interest in keeping those areas, right? Well, and Korea Islands, what they have that is, that is of interest probably to the Japanese, there's a lot of fish. It hasn't been fished out as much. <laughs> so, right. Dr. Selden, pardon me. Because we don't have the mic out here, maybe restate a oh, little okay. bit for our Zoom audience. Sorry, uh, let me see what you so, uh, so what, yep. what the point was, why not open a second front? And she's pointing to the areas of American territory, which we have closely border Russia across the Bering Strait, uh, as a way to sort of distract from this and also create more problems for Russia. Well, I, I think it getting into a very difficult situation, right? The United States has been very careful to support Ukraine without crossing the line of being a belligerent with Russia as a nuclear armed state and, and pushing us closer to that kind of confrontation. Um, but I will take what she said and, and turn it around in some different way. There are ways that you can have other things that would deteriorate Russia's situation that wouldn't necessarily <clears throat> involve a direct American military confrontation. I'll give you one, for example. Um, the Republic of Georgia, which is uh, a former Soviet state, um, has quite rough relations with Russia. Russia played a similar game there in 2008 and took pieces of Georgia's territory. Um, this might be an opportune time for Georgia to be encouraged to push back against that, that would really suck out Russian resources and make life miserable for them. Um, I can see that. Um, so there may be ways to take your idea and do so in a way that keeps the United States hand directly away, but achieve some of the same results without necessarily creating the dangers of actually a direct confrontation. Um, so I, I, I'm answering your question with another one. So, yeah, uh, 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 we have a comment here on from Cecilia Collins. Weren't there Turks in Crimea, and what impact have they mm -hmm. had, if any? You mean, excuse me, historically? It was a, uh, in chat. So yeah, the Crimean population is really interesting. 
there's actually a significant population of, of Crimean Tartars uh, who are Muslim or just Turkic, so I guess they are, maybe that's what you're referring to. Uh, they were treated very poorly by Stalin and, and uh, deported to Central Asia, but many of them have come back since the 1980s. Um, and they're, they're very interesting, they, they're very pro Ukrainian, right? but they're stuck there in Crimea, and now the Russian government is trying to trap them to fight against Ukraine. So they have this thing where now Crimeans are now trying to sneak out and go to places like Kazakhstan to get out of all this. Uh, been a very interesting thing of what's happened in Russia where, and this I think is, is quite dangerous in Russian politics, where it appears that their call of, of reserves and drafting people in has been just proportionately targeting ethnic minorities in Russia. Uh, either uh, more Central Asians, uh, Muslim populations, whatever else, in a way that it's very apparent, right? It looks like you're 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 trying to disadvantage those particular communities. That that's a very dangerous issue to play with in Russia. Um, um, so anything else? Uh, I think I saw Alice, go ahead back there. I agree with you that um, you know, you know, you know, Running for office and they threaten to cut them to Ukraine. And I'm very concerned about that, and I wonder if you have an opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, I understand. Can you be safe? Oh, sorry. Um, Lenny uh, asked there are a number of people, I guess, running for Congress now who have made cutting aid to Ukraine a, um, a point of a campaign. And, uh, you know, would that be the interesting thing? Um, I mean, in my opinion, yes, right? My, my, as you probably gather from my sympathies, I, I think that it is. Well, let me, let me phrase it. Let me change this around. My, my answer to their point is yes, you're right. This is a lot of money that could be spent elsewhere, right? And you're dumping it into a country which is known for its problems with corruption. That said, right? You have a geopolitical situation on your hand um, that if you do not control, has the potential to spin into something much worse. And the cheapest option for the United States is to fund Ukraine to slow this down and blunt Russia's power. Um, this is, to me, a wise and cost-effective way. It doesn't involve our service personnel. Um, and you know, helps us achieve what are really core geopolitical goals of the United States. Right? So I get where they're coming from and their critiques, right? But once again, policy is about finding the least bad option that's going to work for you at a particular time. And in my sense, this is the least bad option. Cutting off that aid would put us in a worse position. Right? So that's how I would answer. Uh, let me let me go back to Rick on Zoom. Go ahead. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I appreciated uh, your presentation of the ethno-linguistic differences in Ukraine, and uh, seems to me that uh, the media is uh, providing us with a certain amount of a biased perspective on Ukraine and and Russia. Uh, perhaps in order to uh, reflect uh, U.S. interest and opinion. Um, Ukraine has had a, a very difficult time coming together. Uh, you talked about uh, the Orange Revolution and other uprisings that reflect differences between the different groups within Ukraine. Um, similarly, uh, it's not clear that we're getting uh, a, a, an accurate picture of what's going on in Russia. In Russia, uh, I think some of the uprisings or resistance to the draft are probably uh, exaggerated. Um, of course, they're happening, but you know whether they reflect you know really what's going on, uh, I don't know. Um, but it, it just seems to me that uh, there are um, some difficulties in getting good information about where each of these two countries are. I, I'd add also that 
that you know as we go into elections that uh, uh, the Republicans continue to bring up uh, uh, Hunter Biden and the enormous corruption that is in Ukraine. Uh, so um, that hasn't gone away. I don't know if there's real solidarity in Ukraine to fight this war for uh, you know years to come. I, could you address the media coverage particularly? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you raise a good point in general, which is that you know your, your your coverage is always going to be media coverage is always going to be episodic and spotty and driven towards the things that provide uh, good feed, right? So things blowing up, right, and people rioting are always going to be much more. I'm, I'm talking to the ceiling. The camera's over there. Yeah. Sorry, the are over there. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, this is the nature of media coverage on anything, right? I mean, when I used to work on a, on, on FDN issues, um, you know, it was always frustrating dealing with media because they would focus on whatever violent thing had happened that day. And I'd be like, well, you know, on the other hand, yeah, a bus did blow up, but we also just had 3,000 girls graduate from high school. You know, these things are both important. You maybe send a camera over here. Um, so that's a function of media. I mean, I think you're you're pointing to a different issue, which is you know, the divisions in Ukraine. One of the things I will say, and from reading people who really are expert on Ukraine and, and on Russia and read those languages. And we were reading the newspaper reports coming out. Um, one of the things that's happened is that for a lot of people who are ethnically Russian in Ukraine and are Ukrainian citizens, feel much more of an attachment now towards Ukraine and the Ukrainian nation than they did before this, right? Because the, the di distinctions have been made very stark, right? In terms of what those governments value and how they are treating people in those different areas. Um, and so I, I think, if anything, what's occurred is that, yes, there are ethno-linguistic divisions in Ukraine, but they were never, they were never violent. <laughs> Sometimes they were marriage and it worked. Um, and I think now it's really pushed a number of people, majority, I don't know, but people who are ethnically Russian to identify much more with the Ukrainian state and nation being part of that. And I have to say that the Ukrainian government has been very careful about not emphasizing the vision, but rather emphasizing the sort of unifying aspects. Um, you know, one thing I'll always give President Zelensky credit for is that he's a man who understands his limitations. Right? He's not trying to plan out military strategy. He understands his role is, and what his skill really is, is communication, is talking to people, is presenting as being a performer, um, and he's done that quite well. So yeah, you can be right, and getting accurate information is oftentimes difficult, um, but you know, sort of getting a sense from what I'm seeing that, that things are perhaps a little different. Will Shaver, did you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for focusing on Ukraine. The, uh, a couple of issues I'm concerned with. The one is the fact that uh, we fortified other border countries like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and I'm sure they do right. things differently. And uh, the idea that Finland and Sweden have come over to NATO uh, are all, to me, pluses. And we've had some deployments into some of those countries. And I wanted to comment on that. And then a second question. Um, it's kind of a surrogate war between the US and Russia, yeah. no matter how you look at it. So you know, that's a chance to uh, check out training and tactics and new weapons and that sort of thing. I'm uh, enamored with the idea of Russia buying uh, these new weapons from Iran, concerning yeah. these little drones that fly over, right. and raise a lot of havoc in civilian communities. Could this be leverage for us to do something with regard to Iran? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm getting excited. You're absolutely right. You can get a real, you know, nothing gives you a better impression of another state's military capabilities by actually being in combat and surrogates. Um, 
So yes, we are definitely learning a lot about that. Uh, we're definitely seeing how they operate, which gives you senses of vulnerabilities and problems. Um, yeah, I, I think that's all very true. The whole issue of bringing in, you know, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania have been NATO members since 2004. Um, so our response there has been to partner with them um, and they each have different partner countries in NATO that really sort of beefed up defenses in those areas. Finland's going to be an interesting uh, Finland's a very long border with Russia. Um, I've been writing a lot about this sort of stuff. Um, and you know, one of the things I've where I think this is actually an area where we could be forging much better NATO, <laughs> NATO EU cooperation. Um, you know, in terms of joint centers on things that would really address the kinds of issues and threats that Russia plays. There are always military, right? It's a lot of what we call information warfare, psychological operations and media manipulation. They, there aren't things necessarily that NATO has to do. The EU can actually build up a lot of, of expertise with, and we can work jointly together to sort of create a more unified strategic partnership in the region. Um, so I'm kind of encouraging people to kind of go down that path. I think that might be helpful. Okay. So my question was about Iran. Okay. Um, just... All right. Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Do you think the EU is doing, you might say, everything they could do to support this war in the uh, Ukraine? I, I sometimes get the feeling that the, that the United States is sort of carrying the, the bulk of this that the eu is not doing everything that they could do it's I, I mean, I think quite frankly yeah let me let me address that on. um so i'm going to say one thing and then my wife will come here in two weeks and put the contradict me <laughs> uh, so uh so don't tell her because at least that are you know two weeks <laughs> uh so my sense is i tend to agree and it's it has to do with the fundamental divisions in the European Union, right? This is still on foreign policy issues. The European Union is still a community of member states with distinct foreign policies and foreign policy bureaucracies. And economic issues are much more knitted together and tied together. But you know, foreign policy is still in the national governments, um, and they have distinct national issues. The big ones is energy, energy supply, right? Um, it's an area where, once again, I think the United States and the European Union could be working on a much better partnership because the United States is now the world's largest producer of, of second largest producer of natural gas. Um, I think if we were working more on our ability to export that and more of that uh, and bring out more of that. I mean, I realize there are you know, our trade offs, right? But I think, you know, if one looks at this strategically, that is something that we could use that would ameliorate this situation. If you want to you know, evaluate the environmental aspects of that, we can in the future. But keep in mind the alternative, right, in Europe now is that they're burning more coal, yes. which from an environmental standpoint is really helping things anyway. So I, I think to me, you know, once again, I, I, I'm always thinking about ways to cement a better transatlantic partnership because I, I honestly believe that the emerging geopolitical contest is, is one between authoritarian systems and, and liberal democratic systems that have fundamentally different values about how the world should operate and what the relationship is between the individual and the state. And the distinctions that we have between the United States and our European partners, these are frankly narcissisms of, of small differences relative to the larger issue. And we need to find ways to knit ourselves together strategically, I think, to confront that and deter that, that kind of problem of evolving. That's that's my hobby horse. Um, any other questions here? We don't have any on Zoom. If we turn this on while his is on, it won't work. Okay. Um, I'll turn this on. Okay. Yeah. But thank you very much. Um, this has been this has been very enlightening. Um, we um, we will all be watching the news every day to see how these things evolve. But but I think understanding one thing that you really uh, that struck me was was 
understand the differences in Ukraine. It isn't all one homogeneous country at all. And, and I think, personally, I think that's going to continue to be a big, big problem. Uh, we'll just have to see how that all works out. Thank you again. Next, we return to another retrospective on the crisis that the EU had to deal with, and that was the financial crisis. If you remember in Greece back in 2012, uh, there was a big concern about they had overborrowed, they were going to be uh, default on their debt and created a huge crisis in Europe. Now, the question is, uh, we know it was resolved, but we're going to get some perspectives on how it was resolved and how uh, it's a, that resolving the crisis has kind of affected the way the EU manages its financial structure. So we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.